Michael Apple, thank you for your super chat. Please discuss the relationship between resurrection, disappearance, and R.C. Miller never gets old. I'm going to leave that to you, Derek, because I have not read him. Okay, I am in love with this book, and you won't believe what happened. So I'm flying back from Florida doing – I did two course recordings, well, lecture recordings with Robin Faith Walsh. Mind-blowing material, Paul and the Gospels, two separate courses. And I was already into chapter two while reading at the hotel while I was out there doing the recordings. And on my way back, chapter two is where you're talking about the actual disappearances. Um, on my way back, I read the rest of the book on the flights and I fell asleep on the last flight. And then I got off the flight and I realized when I got home, oh my gosh, I forgot Richard C. Miller's book on the aircraft. So I like just... You know, so then I ended up um, writing a review, of course, for the book on Amazon. I hope it's up by now. And then contacted him and said, hey, can we get the publisher? I know I'm a knucklehead. Can you get the publisher to send me another book? It's that good of, of a book. That's my little plug for it. The book takes you first into the earliest apologist for Christianity, Justin Martyr, Church Fathers, Origin, you name it. And they're all equivocating Christianity, the Jesus mythos. Topos with that of the sons of, of Zeus, etc. So he wants to first tell you, like, hey, they recognize that this is no different than what you guys are doing over here in the Greek and Roman world with your Caesars, with your demigods, with your gods, with your heroes, you name it, Asclepius, Dionysus, on and on. In chapter two, I'm going to share my screen here to tease people, if you don't mind, Jacob. <clears throat> there you go. Chapter two, right? So here in 2.3, which is the translation fables, he goes into a gallery of names. And of course, the different people in alphabetical order from Aka, what is this, Laurentia? And I mean, literally all of these, every single one of these, I'll give you an example. He gives you the source. Let, let me get one that everybody knows. Let me get one that everybody's heard of. Asclepius, right? So here's Asclepius. The sources where you're going to find it. Hesiod, Hyginus, Hy Hyginus, Astrology 214, Fab, Lucian, Dial, uh, Minusus, Felix, Octavius, Galen, Commentary on the Covenants of Hippocrates, and of course, Origin against Celsus. Fable. Here's the fable. Asclepius was killed by Zeus's lightning and granted translation. After Asclepius' death, Zeus placed Asclepius' body among the stars as the constellation. I always mess this up. I'm just going to call it Serpent Holder. Galen, circa 180 CE, instanced another tradition, tradition indicating that as happened with Hercules and Dionysus, Asclepius ascended to the gods in a column of fire. According to Celsus, Asclepius often appeared in a physical, physical Jesus was born or, or resurrected, as everyone wants to argue. He's in a physical body in some way, right? So he appeared in a physical post-mortem form to perform many miracles of healing. Origen tacitly concurred that such accounts abundantly circulated. Hyginus, or Hyginus, however you pronounce it, reveals that the translated Asclepius became the constellation Ophiuchus. I hope I pronounced that properly. The sub-theme, so you're going to find in the sub-theme of every one of these, the, that particular translation fables kind of details, right? He's associated, the translation is associated with Zeus's thunderbolt. Ascension is, is associated with Asclepius. Post-mortem translation, post-translation appearance, and catastrophism. So at the beginning of this, before he goes into these tons and tons of examples that you see here, that are so worth reading. I mean, there's just so many of them. I had like, I had to drink coffee going through this section because it's hard to get through them. It's really good as a source to go and reference to point out. I mean, look, it, we're not stopping. They're, they're all sub themes that are similar and they're not identical. Sometimes the person uh, goes into a river and like, or a body of water and disappears. Sometimes it's Zeus's thunderbolt. Sometimes it's a pyre of fire, right? So a fire that ends up con uh, uh, consuming them. Sometimes they're walking on a road. Sometimes they're dead and then they're taken. Sometimes they don't even die. Like none of them are Xerox copies of each other. So when the Christian apologists or those who are anti against this notion 
love going, yeah, yeah, no, no, there's no copying. You don't even need to say, just grant them. Sure. Nobody's plagiarizing. Fine. Let's stop arguing that point. You don't need to plagiarize to know that the topos, as we keep saying, the tradition, the stories that are out there, this is how you write them. It's obvious. And it goes on and on and on. So this chapter is a thick one that goes into the various translations. But what is common, what is almost in every case guaranteed to be there, and we can come back to, uh, I'm just showing that chapter too. I didn't even show the whole chapter. It's dense. Every sentence is very dense. So it's not an easy read. It. I had to get my Google out and look up definitions along the way because it was very heavy scholarly stuff. What you find without a doubt ubiquitous across these fables is their body goes missing. The body goes missing in every situation in some way, shape or form. They disappear. Jesus's body is missing from the tomb. It's so obvious. And even if you wanted to argue, let's just say Paul doesn't explicitly say anything like this. He says he's buried and then resurrected. There's no missing body trope or theme in 1 Corinthians 15, but his body is emphasized that he no longer will have flesh and blood, but he has a pneuma body, a spiritual body, right? So even then, it's like the flesh and blood body has to be gone somehow or irrelevant to the point. So is this in line with the rest of the tropes? Mark makes sure that it is. If you don't think Paul did, Mark capitalizes on this. It's legendary. So that I love Richard C. Miller. I love this super chat. I really appreciate people pointing this out. And yep. guess who pointed it out to me? Derek Bennett. <laughs> Derek, no. come here real quick. Just come say hey to everybody. They, you won't be able to hear anybody. Just come wave. It was this guy right here, Derek Bennett. Say hey to Jacob. Hey to everybody. Hey. He introduced me to Richard C. Miller in terms of his work. And then once I found Richard, I was like, get out of my way. No. <laughs> no, I really, I really thank Derek for introducing me to this guy. I didn't even know his book existed. Then when I found it, it was over Jacob. I was like, Oh, he has the sources and everything. You can't play my favorite. Since we're on the page, you get me excited. Mm -hmm. You know me. All right. One more time. I'm sharing the screen just for a second. This you don't you don't have to keep me up too long with this. This is just one point, and this has been shared before. For those who haven't seen it, here it is. This right here. This is the translation of Romulus and Jesus compared. Both have a missing body. Both have prodigies. Both have darkness over the land. Mountaintop speech and great commission where Romulus tells Proculus Julius, hey, go tell them that my city, Rome, will rule the world. Guess what happened? They ruled the freaking world. <gasps> we should worship Romulus now. Come on. Uh, ascension narratives in both. Son of a God. Meeting on a road. Eyewitness testimony. Both were taken away in a cloud. Dubious alternative accounts, meaning there's a, an account where Romulus gets killed by the Senate. And there's another account. He doesn't get killed. He gets taken to heaven. Well, as M. David Litwell points out, or M. David Litwell, Richard C. Miller, sorry, points out in this book, um, this idea of him being killed is actually modeled after Julius Caesar's death by the Senate. So it's actually a Johnny come lately narrative for Romulus. It only is, it only comes up on the scene after Julius Caesar actually gets killed by the Senate. Anyway, um, immortal heavenly body, outside the city, people flee, deification, belief, homage, and rejoicing, bright and shining appearance, and then Frightened, all in sorrow over loss, inspired message of apotheosis. There you go. 